Good evening and welcome back to Checkpoint. We are happy to have your company with us this evening. David D and Bilo Kero are my guests on set and we're talking about just some of those sticky areas and issues uh, emerging post a handshake. And uh, Carol, let me come to you. We were talking about just before we went on the break. Is the fundamental issue in your view that ODM as a party is Raila Odinga and Raila is ODM. There are people who have said that so that no matter what other politicians within the party say, when Baba, as he's called, uh, says it is A or right, you best com uh, go that direction. If not, then you're outside the party. Yes, I, I think uh, um, it's not only ODM. In all, all our political parties, we still suffer the big man syndrome. The one who's it's the parties that owned. Are we not seeing more defiance in Jubilee even within no, the president's no. backyard? The only defiance is because between the leader and the deputy leader. And so that one group is with the leader and the other because of the politics. But otherwise, when, there's, when it comes to the crunch, the party leader for Jubilee has summoned them and told them, I want this, and they do it. Um, and we've seen it in, in, in many instances. So, um, ODM, yes, ODM is Raila. And, and, and Raila's ODM. So ultimately, really, the, the, instruct, the structures of the political party don't mean much in this country. It, it's the leader, because the, the reason why we have the big man syndrome in our political parties is because of the funding. Um, the political party's uh, funding has not yet properly you know, taken effect in, in the country from the government. So what happens is that the political parties are funded by, through the deep pockets of the, of the leader. So he's the one who calls the shot. And um, well, this we're is giving ODM some, is it four billion? I saw they won. Yeah, they, 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 they won something, but that's yeah. still a long way. <laughs> By the time you, you, you yeah. go to appeal and so forth. And, and, and you, you know, this is why, but, but unfortunately, I think just to comment on some, on the issue about the, um, you know, when, when, the, when two leaders of political parties come together, as in the case of this handshake, and like you said, apart from the fact that it was not structured, it would have really been a matter of goodwill, had it not been the fact, for the fact that, they played some cards on the table and some cards under the table. I mean, it's clear that, that the, the cards being played under the table. Like this what? Is, what do you think is under the table? Well, I wish we knew. It's, it's only the two of them who know. <laughs> yeah. But the rest of the country can only, you know, speculate. speculate. And that's what has happened. And this is why the handshake has, has, has been receiving a lot of um, uh, negative, um, if you will, um, uh, you know, uh, reaction from many, from Kenyans, because people see it as those who are supporting deputy, for example, the president believe that it's targeted to them. Uh, others believe it's about giving jobs to, to Raila. Others believe it's about giving jobs in future to Uhuru. So th the reason why there's all this speculation is because they're playing their cards on the table, really. There isn't much that they put on the table, mm. except to say we want to unite. And like he said, uh, there isn't much about unity. Um, and, 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 and they keep talking about the fact that, you know, we are, it's about inclusion and we want to amend the constitution and try and bring inclusivity. There's no inclusivity even today. They can do it if they want. Look at the appointments being done. All skewed. Um, you know, and, and, and what, what inclusivity are you talking about? There's, the constitution is so clear about inclusivity. For example, regarding appointments, that you must take into account ethnic ethnicity. You must take into account regional representation. You must take into account all those factors. But you don't need to amend the constitution to try and say, oh, you know, we want to bring them. Unless you're talking about bringing the big guys on the table to, mm. to eat, I mean, really. So I, I think the, this the political party, that's why we keep folding our political parties, to suit There's that no leader's ideology. plans. It's not ideological. You remember PNU? Yeah. It was set up 90 days before the election. <laughs> TNA, 90 days before the election. Jubilee, the same thing happened. I Just bet a you few, in 2022 And 2022, more. all these things will be off the board. You'll get a new... <laughs> outfit the boss wants yeah, yeah. the boss will wake up and says i want this one now and you've had already some people within the jubilee saying look we'll we'll have something new yeah. you know of life so it, you won't be surprised so it's not about a political there's no ideology there's no structure it, it's it's about where the boss wants and it's mm. it's a vehicle for getting to power after you get to power it's you know it's, it no longer matters really the boss will determine what to do mm. and, and that that's why you get that perception that yeah. um, odm is all about and they can't really do much. Yeah. Um, uh, did, did you agree with that view? And also talk to us about, then should Kenyans look at the handshake as purely something 
that benefits two gentlemen. That for Uhuru Kenyatta, the president managed to neutralize Vanquish, an erstwhile enemy, um, and now has him as a cooperator. For uh, Raila Odinga, as you've talked about, in government, all the trappings of power is what he's enjoying now. But it really has nothing to do with Kenyans. Um, I think what we see in the handshake now is the politics of self-preservation. Uh, because, as I said, you can look at three things. We had a roadmap for electoral justice. Then you had the MOU, what is written on paper. Mm -hmm. And then you have the practice that we are observing. Now, if you go to the roadmap, our roadmap envisaged a transitional arrangement where Raila and Uhuru would lead a transitional arrangement to a traditional government. That transitional government would do reforms mm -hmm. and both Raila and Uhuru would retire in 2022, having midwifed reforms. Mm. Okay, so they would be referees in the 2022 election. Mm -hmm. And if they did that, they would have had a lot of goodwill if they announced. And so that there's a bit of confusion because when we talk about the referendum, the referendum we were talking about at the beginning and the referendum which is being talked about now is not the same. Because the referendum we were talking about was to create a transitional government instrument mm -hmm. in the same way that uh, after the PEV, we had a transitional government instrument, the one which created the government of national unity. Mm -hmm. But that was under the old constitution. Under the new constitution, that needs to go to a referendum. That could have been done without going to a referendum. You couldn't do it without going to a referendum. Mm -hmm. It was not a referendum for constitutional reforms. So that would have created a transitional government uh, instrument. Reforms would have been worked out under that transitional government. There would have been a referendum now to implement those reforms if necessary. But hopefully, we had hoped that would be uncontentious because the whole country would have been behind them. Together. And because Raila and Huru would have been referees, Ruto and Musalia and all the others would have run the election. There would be no need for this antagonism mm -hmm. that we are seeing now. The roadmap, uh, or rather the, the, the MOU, was a non-state process. It said very clearly that this is personal. Raila and Uhuru will lead a non-state process outside government to reconcile Kenyans. Mm. But then they created the Building Bridges Task Force, which is a state instrument because it was gazetted. So already you see the movement. Mm. It was not. The MOU did not envisage a task force going around collecting views for constitutional reform. It envisaged Raila and Uhulu reading a national dialogue. Mm. They haven't done that. We tried to push them very hard. I certainly tried to push the Raila side very hard to set up a structure that would facilitate that kind of dialogue. What would it have looked like? What it would it have to... looked like something outside of government, right. probably something like with the Serena process, but staying outside of government, okay. uh, with participation of civil society and church leaders and also people, Ufungaman, all those people. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It would not have been a, ta a secret task force of bureaucrats and um, all manner of people. We don't know what they are doing. There's no conversation. Yeah. And I raised these questions. Is Uhuru committed to this sort of process? Mm. And then there was a lot of pushback. And that's the point I said, okay, this is not what I signed up for and, and left. Mm. Then you have now the practice. What you see in practice is Raila championing Jubilee agenda. Okay? And forcing, pushing his party. Yes. Sort of like uh, whipping his party to do that. And being an envoy and all manner of things on his own. So what you see is not a transitional agenda, but in fact a succession agenda. Yeah. So what you see is the politics of self-preservation, which seem meant to ensure that uh, Uhuru and his constituency will continue to play a role beyond uh, the end of his term. And part of that seems either to be able to take William Bruto out of the equation or to put, force him to be part of whatever sort of uh, animal that they want to they create. create. And okay. then the, the constitutional referendum has become one of probably trying to create political accommodation mm. as opposed to dealing with the electoral justice problem 
that brought yeah. us into this situation in the first place. Right. That's what I see from where I see it. Okay. So you've severed ties as I come to you. With, Absolutely. You've uh, severed ties with ODM, with the former prime minister. I, I was not part of ODM. I, I came yeah. in to support uh, the establishment of a national coalition, uh, op united opposition. I okay. said that in public at yeah. Bomas. I was really not uh, there to whatever. Okay. And then when obviously that, that the agenda we were pursuing ended <coughs> and it became a sort of agenda where he's talking about yeah. which has got some cards under the table. I don't want to work with cards which are under the table. All right. So okay. I said I yes. but, but, but I, but I so, think yeah. even the, the, the information he's just revealed that there was um, in that structured arrangement that they wanted, mm -hmm. they wanted a transitional government to be headed by Uhuru and Raila. I think that those that even that aspect of the um, if you will uh, ODM or its opposition or NASA whatever arrangement has, has, has never been made public that there was in, or whether there was an MOU in fact between Uhuru and, and Raila all, all that the Kenyans know today is that there are two people agreed on something and um, and they said this is what we agreed but I, th I think it's important that it's coming out that there, there was an MOU and that there was a plan for a transitional uh, sort of government between Raila and, and this is why uh, perhaps there's been a lot of um, uh, reaction uh, uh, to it from the deputy president's side perhaps uh, because maybe uh, because of that fact. But, uh, but I think th this, is, this, is the, this is the problem we have in this country that um, uh, when MOUs or this kind of arrangements are done, they are never made public. The nine-point agenda, they yeah. argue, was the, the MOU. MOU. The no, MOU that's is, not an MOU. The MOU that's is the nine-point agenda. That's a task. That was, huh? a, that no, was no, terms of reference. The nine, no, the nine-point agenda, if you go to the end of it, that's the MOU. That's the it MOU. is signed by the two gentlemen at the end. And if you read it carefully, it is what I'm saying. You see, let me, let me, let me clarify. Yeah. If we were going into a structured arrangement, we would have had NASA negotiating with Jubilee. Right. So William Ruto and Uhuru would have been on, the, on that side. So, yeah, and uh, Raila and Kalonzo and Musalia and Wetangula and their technical team would have been on this side. Mm. That's what we mean, we mean by a structured process. Okay. But Raila and Uhuru abandoned their, both their political parties and, and government, went and cut a deal, okay, came out with this document. Mm. And, we said, and they said, no, we are going to deal this as leaders. We are not going to deal with this as political uh, parties and yeah. political process. We are going to deal with it as national leaders. After all, these challenges we are going, we inherited them from our fathers. Mm -hmm. the, the document says as much, isn't it? Um, so we said, okay, if you're going to go out and reconcile Kenyans, uh, you know, power to you. Okay? Mm -hmm. and you're going to reconcile Kenyans. Then as soon as they finish saying they're going to reconcile Kenyans, they turn on William Ruto. Mm -hmm. Then they ask, if you are trying to reconcile Kenyans, you should be reconciling all Kenyans. So why are you turning on William Ruto? Okay. Look at our, yeah? All right. So the, that, those are the contradictions these I'm talking the about. Contradictions. Because William Ruto should have been on the table in a structured uh, negotiation as a deputy president and mm. the deputy leader of, whatever, of Jubilee. And we should have been on the other side. And we should have hammered out how we are going to navigate ourselves out of that crisis created by the 2017 election. So I call the, we should have, we had said we don't want a boardroom mm. deal. We want a public okay. uh, deal. I call what we have a barroom deal. A barroom? Uh, yeah, it wasn't a boardroom deal. <laughs> it wasn't even a boardroom Okay, but before no, you but comment. I just wanted to mention that, you see, yes. this BBI thing, really, it's, it's not based on any legal or constitutional framework or architecture in this country. Mm -hmm. I mean, there, there, there is a process that this country has always followed when we are amending our constitution or when we are if you look at it the way it's just the two gentlemen simply sat down and agreed on something and said we're setting up this thing and funding it and it goes i mean it, it, it's something that frankly it undermines the the, the if you look if you will the the, the constitution the, um, the spirit of the constitution because when you are it, it in the constitution we have got a significant amount of 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 of, 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 of issues and values that as a country we should we should follow in fact including trying to bring together you know people and so forth mm. but you know the way you set up as two individuals of two political parties that this is what we want and these are the gentlemen who are going to do it and you go around and collect views 
I, I don't think it was done really in the, yeah. in, the, in, the, in the... This is why that perception is there, that there are cards under the table. Under the table. Uh, yeah. I want to wrap up for our viewers uh, watching us on KTN Home. Uh, that's all the time we had for you this evening. But you can switch over to KTN News where this conversation continues right now. Right, so um, to the point you're making, uh, Carol, then, is that there's been, the politicians have been disingenuous in that, in your view, these are issues that can be canvassed with the laws we have right now, and these are some of the things you don't even need laws to fix. For instance, inclusivity, and the president attended uh, a woman, women's meeting, development uh, of the women agenda in Canada the other day, and it still continues to be a glaring issue that his cabinet does not meet the not more than two-thirds gender rule. And that's a point of position. As a country, we risk the uh, Chief Justice uh, dissolving parliament because of all the failed attempts, again, to fix the same. So then what, where does that leave Kenya then? We, we have, in my view, we have a very good constitution. Yeah. You don't need to amend anything in this constitution. It's about failure to implement the constitution. The problems we are having, forget about these stories, we want to strengthen the devolution. If the government implemented this constitution, devolution would be foul today. Mm, mm. Many of the challenges we have of the government borrowing and being in crisis is because the government has not implemented this constitution as required. For instance, if you take the devolution alone, there are many government functions, national government, that should have been devolved to the county governments, and they know it. And we've tried for years. Please, this is not your function. Even where the functions have been devolved, you find national government is still wanting to do some of the things. Example is the water supply. Major, many of the water supply functions have been devolved. Go national government has no business putting up a thousand uh, cubic meters dam. You know, as they mentioned the other day, putting up thousands of dams all over the place. Uh, they have no business buying medical equipment and things for hospitals. Over 90 Five ninety-eight percent of the functions of the medical health services have been devolved. So, so, so it, the constitution really uh, has addressed many of these challenges. It's about implementation. Mm. We have no fidelity to the constitution. So, what happens is that we are always looking for um, some legal excuse that you know, oh, this happened. Yes, we need law. This country, for heaven's sake, is over-regulated. We have every statute you can think of, and they are there. For example, these appointments we mentioned a few minutes ago. The National Cohesion and Integrity, I think, Act, if I'm not wrong, mm. is very clear on, 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 on how appointments are supposed to be done, mm. and including what percentage should come from one ethnic community and, you know, maximum in any appointments that are done. The issue of women and the issue of, um, uh, you know, of, of, of other marginalized, whatever, in the Constitution, these things are very elaborate. It's, so we don't want to implement the Constitution, and we keep saying that, you know, uh, there's a problem, so it, it's not really. So I think we, I, many of us get the perception that this attempt to try and create BBI, it's a backroom door to try and amend the constitution. Mm. And, and I don't think, um, unless the government uh, uh, you know, wants to use the Vifaranga story again, I don't see how anybody would convince Kenyans that after they come up with the questions, the questions for the referendum, how you can convince Kenyans that there's need to amend this constitution for the purpose of Wanjiku. Yeah. You can't. Look at what's happened in this country in the last three, four, three years, mm. two years. Every action the government has taken has been to put pressure on the cost of living of, of ordinary Kenyans. Really, everything, try to make things difficult. And, and recently, one of the uh, Jubilee uh, senators actually was frustrated and he said, is this government at war with its citizens? <laughs> and, and you get that perception. You know, they, they don't seem to be in touch with the reality that people are already suffering. You're bringing one rule after the other. You increase the taxes. You know, you, this rule, uh, no second-hand vehicles. You can't bring space. You have to pay, you know. Yeah. It's crazy. Like, people are suffering out there, mm -hmm. but the government doesn't seem to be in touch with what's going on. And, 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 and so tomorrow, if you bring an amendment to the Constitution, that will create more burdens, uh, create more positions, or create more burdens for the people. I don't see Kenyans, really. Um, going Accepting that. that. Um, I wonder what you make, Ndi, uh, whether Raila Odinga, as party leader of the Orange Democratic Movement, um, the party that's a minority in parliament, 
is accountable to Kenyans. Because I saw a debate uh, one of the times on, on social media where I think it was Patrick Gathara who was calling and asking for questions what happened to all the issues he raised about whether it was the SGR, um, the Eurobond at the time during the campaigns, and now uh, silence on those issues. So is, there, is it a legitimate um, question when people want to know, okay, you had these issues on SGR, now you're supporting government on extension of something in the, from the very beginning you had a huge big problem with. Um, is that a concern that's valid or is he, because he's not an elected member, don't ask him questions. You support perhaps those of his supporters who say that uh, it's not just Raila's job to oppose. If you want to oppose, you go ahead and oppose yourself. It's, 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 it's a confusion created by the institution of sort of uh, dysfunction I've mentioned. Right. Because, uh, as I said, in a, in a presidential system, the party gives you a ticket as a presidential candidate. You actually run your campaign as a presidential campaign. Once the party gives you a ticket, if you look at the US, which is where we've copied this, uh, it gives you a ticket, you go off and set up a, a presidential campaign. The party goes back to fight for its seats in Congress because that's, that's what the separation, the essence of parliament, of presidential system is separation of legislature and executive. So you go off to fight to become a president and look for, and the parties go back to look for seats and governorships and all sorts of things. And if you don't win, like Hillary Clinton, you go home and you decide whether you're going to contest again, then you go to the primaries again or not. Mm -hmm. But you are out uh, of, of, of the scene. And it is now the party in the Congress and the leadership of the party in Congress that uh, is the opposite, is, is, is the minority or, it can be majority, it is not even tied to, my, because you can have a majority which is not the same as the executive. Okay? In the parliamentary system, executive and majority are joined in parliament. They both come from parliament. Okay? So now that's the confusion that we are having. Because in a pure presidential system, Raila Odinga should be out of the scene. And of course, the institution is then complicated by our electoral crisis of 2017, which has kept him on the scene. Yeah? And then again, instead of having the a structured institutional process, as I said, you have a personalized uh, attempt uh, to resolve these, which gives them in, in informal uh, sort of state, mm -hmm. uh, sort of uh, position. So it's, it's a peculiar situation. It's not easy yeah. uh, to be able to answer yes or no, whether they should be accountable or you shouldn't. Uh, but the informality of what him and who are doing using public resources is certainly questionable. Okay. But unfortunately, the people who would question is the legislature. But the, because of our personalized big man syndrome, the legislature has now become a rubber stamp. Uh, it cannot actually be able to do that. Even mm. publicly, yeah. there is accountability from the minority because they are funded. Mm -hmm. The minority party leadership is funded through the taxpayers. Mm -hmm. The leader of official majority, the leader of the, the, the minority whip, yeah. and all the leadership in the minority, they enjoy benefits by virtue of their position because they are expected to be as a minority leader to be opposition. That's why they have got offices and cars and they get you know, funding for that completely. And because of that, they are. They are accountable to the people of Kenya because they are getting resources to carry out their mandate of holding the government or the ruling party to account. So if they fail to do so, I agree with, 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 with that argument about Mother Gadara, they ought to, apart from the, the presidential candidate, but the leadership in parliament is accountable. Mm. That's why they are being given offices, that's why they are given resources, that's why they are funded. And you know, just like, you know, they, they enjoy all those trappings and all those benefits. The idea is so that they can carry out their mandate effectively. The constitution mm -hmm. really provides for that. Yeah. So when they don't, and they become um, an appendage of the executive, or they become part of the ruling party, as has happened now, then I think they should be held to account. And so I then, do, would you say opposition in Kenya is dead? And keeping in mind, you have the likes of Musalia Mudavidi, who time and again, he has kept 
up with the national issues, addresses the media, even gives what he, in his view, are alternatives or proposals of what needs to be done. But there are those who argue he doesn't have the political muscle, not the He's grounders not of, answer. again, right, Laudenga. So is political opposition in its real sense what it's supposed to when be? When we talk of opposition, it's the elected leadership who have been deemed to be opposition by virtue of the number of votes they have won or since they have won. And in this case, the minority party leadership. That is the opposition. Not me and him and whatever the people who have not been elected. <laughs> we are out there. We, we, or civil society, or the media. This, these are not opposition. The opposition, you know, the understanding in politics about opposition are those people who have been elected to parliament, who did not form government, but are there. Then to rephrase my question, to keep government to account, can those kind of voices still manage to do it, to hold government to account to the checks and the balances? Now that the avenue that is provided by the constitution appears not to be working, so the likes of Mudavadi, Kuru Court and his proposals around change of uh, law, can those work? Oh yes, that's the alternative uh, <laughs> voices that, that have worked always, the media, the civil society, these are the people who have always, not only in Kenya, mm. but in many governments in this world, these are the okay. people who hold governments to account. Can they work really? But Do they have significance? We need to recognize yeah. that we have created this animal called pre-election coalitions. So we formed a coalition. The, opposition, the minority in parliament is NASA. Mm. Mm. Because we formed a formal pact and we deposited that instrument to the Registrar of Political Parties. I was leading that process mm. in the sense of putting the, the technical things together. Mm -hmm. Now, so the leaders of those parties actually are the custodians of that pact. So in a sense, Musali Abudavadi as the leader of ANC, uh, actually in this mongrel sort of uh, system of us we have created, does have a say. Because he's a leader of a political party, mm -hmm. which is part of that coalition. So he's the leader of those members of ANC who are in parliament, and Raila as well. And that's the thing I'm describing as an anomaly, because Coalitions are creatures of parliamentary systems, and they are post-election. First of all, you have an election. If no party has an absolute majority, then parties come together to form government. The situation which you have a coalition formed before the election to win the presidency, and then it goes into parliament, and it is not in government, it's quite an anomaly because it doesn't need to be an anomaly. Coalitions are formed after elections so that the government can have a majority. Now we have a coalition which is in, in parliament for no sort of functional reason yeah. other than it was formed to try and win uh, the executive power and it is now a remnant. Mm of that failed attempt to win uh, executive power. And it may not even survive uh, to the, in fact, there's provision of how we can dissolve it uh, before the next uh, election. election. So the problem is that um, we have not been able to design a multi-party system which works. There is, there's a phrase you will be hearing a lot mm. in the coming days called consociation or democracy. This is the thinking which is coming along from Western powers, that these ethnically divided societies like ours, uh, these sort of adversarial politics cannot work. And what you need is ethnic coalitions of all tribes, what you call big tent politics, like they had in Malaysia uh, under UMNO for, for a very long time. Uh, so that you actually don't have an opposition. Mm -hmm. So again, it, it's almost back to one party. Okay. One party system. Yeah, called negotiated the, democracy. Yes, uh, co consociational democracy. Mm -hmm. There's something he said about fidelity to the constitution. Mm. And uh, that is really the fundamental issue. Because if you, there's, a, there's an interview that Uhuru Kenyatta did before, during the election. And he said, and I recall that he said, that the problem is, we were trying to explain why he hadn't done as much as he could have during his first term. And he said the problem is the constitution. Under the old constitution, he would have been able to do more. more. Remember we passed the new constitution so that we can devolve and diffuse power yeah. from this over-centralized 
overbearing executive. Uhuru doesn't believe in it. So what he's describing and what you're seeing, the lack of that fidelity to the Constitution is because of not believing in that Constitution. And what you're seeing is clawing back. All those things are attempts to claw back power. Okay. Um, that's why devolution is a problem, you see, uh, because it's the main uh, sort of institutional innovation that's mm -hmm. doing that. And what you're seeing under the handshake, in fact, suggests that we are seeing a replay of 1964, when again we had a constitution with very diffused power. Mm -hmm. Kanu did not like it, and therefore it forced, uh, it sort of strangled the, both devolution mm -hmm. and the okay. opposition, and forced everybody back into one big tent, which yeah. became a one-party state. Right. And that looks like where we are headed. I mean, that's what looks like what the real cards under the table of the handshake actually are. Ah, so before we wrap up, we, we must talk about the other side. I think we've dwelt a lot on the opposition side, but uh, as they shook hands and talked about unity, disunity started uh, growing within Jubilee and now Kileweke and Tangatanga is what the groups within are referred to the camps there. How does this in your view affect governance when the president and his deputy are pulling different directions? I think it does obviously um, affect the running of government um, and we've seen it um, uh, already in, 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 in the way the um, the two sides um, have taken opposing views on some of the um, uh, policies or decisions of the government. But I, I, I think in my view, really, the buck stops with the president. Mm. I mean, you are the leader of the party and you are the leader of the country. Um, so to the extent that you are not able to give direction to your own party and by extension to your own government, says a lot really and, and, and you can't um, so you, you, clearly you, you will see from what is going on in Jubilee some lack of leadership it, it, it's, it's apparent that um, um, there is that lack of leadership to, you know somebody not stamping his authority and saying no let us have this and this is what we want to do mm. um, he says no politics politics goes on so um, what can he wants do? corruption is corruption it's not a problem he's told off mm -hmm. uh, so uh, really uh, <laughs> so it, it's not about some people have given the uh, argument that you know he's lambda because he's on his last term i don't think that's the case i think the president still has immense powers by the way um certainly with regards to the government if not the party at least with those executives he has powers there's mm -hmm. nothing that stops the president to send his, his executive home tomorrow and, 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 and reconstitute a new one. Um, and, and, and for example, in this war on corruption, there are countries that do not focus on the legal aspects. If, if it's corruption at that level of cabinet and you know, very even you send a message by sending people home. It's enough for you to be ashamed in the media and being fired. It's enough. There are countries like Sweden, I know, that do not, it, for the last 50 years, they haven't taken any senior government officer to, to court because they believe that if you have been fired, and if you have been exposed, it's enough punishment, and you don't need to. They don't. So, to, for, for for the president, for example, to argue that no, I have to follow the rule of law, with regards to how his executive works, well, I, I think clearly it, it, it means that he um, uh, is unable to, to to really rein in the team. And so, um, it's unfortunate the country suffers because then you you know when when people pull in different directions, um, then policy is affected. Um, implementation, uh, you see the president saying one day, no more new projects. The next day, the deputy is launching new projects. You, you, you don't understand what exactly where this country is going. And, mm -hmm. and, and, and so even within government now, there's confusion. If you ask at some level, they don't know whom to deal with. If you deal with uh, one side, you are told, my friend, you are on our wrong side. So you are going to be blacklisted. And so, so people are really walking a tightrope in government, mm -hmm. uh, especially senior officers who have to deal with you know, with, with, with the executive at that level. So I, I don't think, I, I think it's a shame, but, but, but mm. I, frankly, there are many in this country who now think that Jubilee is a letdown. Okay. Uh, and by extension, really the presidency, because that's where the buck stops. Right. Uh, yeah, that, that this country, people feel let down. Um, in this, not only in the war on corruption, but in many of the things that happen, there's no direction, mm. uh, you know, and, 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 and um, okay. it, it's a pity that um, mm. he's 
Mm. We don't see authority. Authority being part, stamped. Yes, yeah. in government. I wonder what you make of the same D, and also keeping in mind that there are those who now have argued that in fact the more vibrant opposition that has been seen is in the country is within the president's party. I think uh, I think corruption is a good lens to view this. Eh? Yeah. Uh, the lame duck politics and all of that. I think that the problem with corruption and the, the presidency is, is twofold. Mm -hmm. One is one which I actually raised right here when uh, we had that conversation, mm -hmm. that uh, the war on corruption has been weaponized for politics. And once we weaponize it for politics, you obviously divided the people into, you're fighting, you know, sort of two camps. I remember I sort of, I, mm -hmm, I, mm -hmm. I raised that, I said that's a, a risk, it's a danger. Yes. Because uh, you could win the war on corruption, but you would, you, you, you could not, maybe you may not win the war on politics, mm. you know, so you mix the two, you conflict, you undermine it. It always sort of blows back when you weaponize uh, the anti-corruption for politics. Mm. The second one, uh, and why you should not have done it in the first place, is the president is himself is conflicted. Because this corruption he's trying to fight happened when he was in office, during his first term. It was done by his people. Okay? Mm -hmm. He did not do anything then. So it's very difficult to turn around and start sort of uh, digging into things which, which have happened under your watch. And the buck stops with you. He says they want vigilante justice. Yeah, that's fine. But he first of all, he says he's going to fight this, and then he turns around now. Four or five years ago, he walked into parliament with a piece of paper waving with all sort of names of people. Uh, and then he went ahead and sort of uh, nothing came out of that. Uh, so basically, he, he, the thing with him is that he cannot, he cannot demonstrate resolve. I say he's conflicted. Mm. He's a beneficiary of the political benefits of why that corruption has been done. He is a beneficiary of financial corruption scandals that we know of. Okay? So he can be blackmailed. People know, people close to him, and thinks he's a beneficiary of, and when they go after, he goes after them, they pull out the yellow card, as people are saying. So he's been shown the yellow card a couple of times, and then he's pulled back. And he was not always the most courageous person uh, when it comes to taking the bull by the horns. Mm -hmm. Um, so, mixed signals, politicizing it, yeah. uh, it was bound to fail. I mean, this was, this was sort of uh, doomed. I don't even think it was serious. Uh, what it was meant to was for political purposes. Okay. And that political purpose has not worked. Right. So, it is probably a, a person from the president's own camp told me, uh, after the State of the Nation address, that that was a white flag on, 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 on corruption. He's thrown in the towel. Wow. Wow. Final words, 30 seconds. Our time is up. Your final thoughts in as far as everything we've talked about, what you see as the way forward? No, I think this country deserves better, really. Um, if there's anyone who has enjoyed the goodwill of the people, really, this president did. And it's unfortunate that, um, uh, you know, the, the, the years are going by and that goodwill is, is, is really eroding very fast. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, and, 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 and today the challenges Kenyans face, it, it, it's about survival, really. The cost of living, millions of Kenyans are struggling to stay alive. The economy, that don't, don't, don't look at NY, uh, this um, Nairobi Stock Exchange. The rest of the economy is suffering, really. Mm. Suffering. And people are, you know, every businessman is complaining. Uh, and the government does not seem to be focused on that. And, and right. by and large, you find a government, you know, if, even this current thing, uh, they're not. You'll, you'll find that the small businesses are going to be hit. Mm. They're going to be hit. It's not about corruption. If government wants to focus on corruption, they know where the corruption money is. I mean, you don't expect those big guys, their money to be hidden. Under, they, 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 they put it in banks. It's not a big deal. Any bank, all the commercial banks can launder money for you. It's not a big deal for a fee. They have done it. The NYS money has been done. In the elections, they, you know, hundreds, they tens, of, tens of billions were <laughs> yeah, being transacted really, really, really cash. Okay. So that, that, but look at what is going to happen to these small people who mm. have to deal in cash day to day. So I, I, I think, in, in my view, this government really is a letdown.
um, and on the hopes of Kenyans. Um, and, and, you know, um, and, 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 and unfortunately, the uh, guy who had given that alternative in the elections, uh, Raila, has not helped matters okay. by being part of the system. Uh, yeah. He's just being viewed now by many Kenyans as being part of the system. And so we have a situation where Kenyans are more or less feeling helpless. You know, one exposure after the other. One, you know, you, you feel one every day is a sad news. Next. Yes. Okay. Uh, we become more or less helpless. And we've been numbed by all these exposures to the mm -hmm. point where some of us don't even react anymore to it. You know, you just throw in the towel and say, e night. Well, we cannot be hopeless. I hope we will not get to that. We, 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 must, uh, we, on, noise. <laughs> we must keep talking, discussing, and hopefully at some point, uh, some change, hopefully. David Ndee, Bilo Kero, thank you for being with us here.